Tonight, we are ready to start our Ask a Naturalist program. Best of the best, 2023. All right. Oh, look at cute bears. <laughs> All right. So we're going to start off right at uh, asking you to do some stuff. We have a picture here of an animal, and there's going to be a poll. It says, help me positively identify an early morning visitor that was right in my backyard after the last big snowstorm. This was from Marion, and she's from Peterborough, New Hampshire. And here are the choices. <coughs> Mink, otter, fisher, weasel-shaped log, or neighbor's dachshund. This is a fisher. And um, it can be easily confused um, at first glance with something that might be an otter or a weasel or a mink or a marten because they all have a similar body shape. But a good clue on this animal is that fuzzy tail. Um, so Miles is pointing with the pointer at the fuzzy tail. An otter would have a sleeker profile. And it, it's hard to judge the scale of this, but a mink is much smaller than an otter and a weasel would be even smaller. So this is an elusive fisher. And you might notice I am really saying fisher and not fisher cat because that is incorrect. Fisher cat is a wrong nickname. These are fishers in the weasel family, not in the cat family. So when you add cat to it, it makes it sound like it's in the cat family. So yay to all of you. This is a fisher. Good job. All right, now we'll get on to an actual work for everybody else. Let's see what, what's our next question, Miles. All right, this little woodland salamander showed up under my watering can. Is it some iteration of a red F? I have many of those pass through my yard, but I've never seen a solid like this. It's so cool. And this is from Carol, and this came in in 2021. And Brett, this is right up your alley in amphibians and reptiles. What do you get to tell us? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so I often hear from people about red Fs. I think they're probably our most visible salamander. I'm sure you've all seen them on rainy days in the woods. Um, and those are the bright orange, um, the bright orange, tiny salamanders. Um, and they, part of the reason we see them so much is because they, like us, are diurnal. They're day active. Um, and many other salamanders are either nocturnal or fossorial. So they live underground. Um, and red Fs are one of the very few who are living above ground and active during the day. This is not a red F, um, but it is our most, um, one of our most common salamander species. This is, you can kind of see if you look at it, um, there's a rust red stripe kind of running down its back. And that is the clue to what this species is. It's called a red-backed salamander. Um, and I also want to commend Carol because she put uh, a quarter in there for scale, which we always love uh, at Ask a Naturalist to help us figure out how big we're, um, the things that we're looking at are. And the red-backed salamanders, these are the ones that you might see under your wood in your wood pile or under rocks. Um, I once heard about a field biologist who for a party trick Whenever he was at a party, he could tell people that he could produce a wild salamander within 15 minutes, wherever he was. And I'm guessing he lived in the range of the redback salamander because they are so common that if you turn over five logs in the woods, you, you um, will certainly see at least one redback salamander and many, maybe many more than that. Um, and one thing I always like to share with people about redback salamanders is that they are um, probably our most numerous vertebrate. There's probably, um, so there was a really um, seminal study done of them in Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest in New Hampshire in the 70s. And they looked at the biomass of redback salamanders. So essentially taking the mass of one salamander and multiplying that by the, all of the salamanders that they could find in those woods. So think about putting all of the redback salamanders on one side of a scale. And then they compared that to other animals. And what they found is that just the redback salamanders alone, um, their biomass was more than twice that of all the breeding songbirds in that forest at peak bird breeding season, and also on par with all the small mammals. So um, what that tells us is that they are incredibly numerous, even if we don't see them, because they're moving around underground, and they're really important parts of our forest ecosystems. 
um, probably transporting a lot of nutrients through their bodies, eating invertebrates and being eaten by turkeys and foxes and snakes and pretty much everything else. So if you see a redback salamander, um, I definitely encourage you to take a moment to appreciate it. They are um, really at the heart of our forest food webs and just really cool critters to um, take a look at. And right now they're probably pretty deep underground. So October is a great time to go looking for them. Um, although I don't know, we had a lot of rain yesterday and 60 degree temperatures. Maybe they're closer to the surface than they might otherwise be in December. Thank you, Brett. That was really fascinating. And I'm going to try that party trick, maybe. <laughs> um, and I will. Oh, here we go. This is a, a chance for you. This is a uh, we are having a contest here. Whoever puts the correct answer into the chat first. And I'm going to ask Jenna to be the judge. Um, whoever puts it in the chat first will win a bandana, a Harris Center bandana. Whoa. All right. Here's it. Last year around this time, I saw these little bugs come out on the snow. What are they doing? And what are they? And what are they doing from anonymous? Maybe Jenna, you could tell us a little bit about this. We have a video. Um, yeah. So let me just um, mention that springtails, when I was first in school for entomology, springtails were thought to be insects and they were classified as such, but they are now um, no longer. They're in the phylum arthropoda, which is, you know, all the arthropods. And then they are considered hexapods and um, not insects anymore. So they're a simpler, um, simpler form of life, I guess you'd say. But the uh, they're a fascinating little creature because what they do is they're omnivores. So they're going to feed on fungi, spores, and they're going to feed on um, dead plants, and they'll feed on all kinds of little lichen and things like that. And so uh, the fascinating thing related to this question is why they would be congregating. Um, unfortunately, we can't ask them. So the best, the best guess for this one is that um, there's either some delicious food source there, or and slash or there's something related to mating now i don't know what the temperature was in this particular situation if they'd been hungry for a while what time of year so there's those are two possible things the reason they get their name springtail is that they have this amazing little um structure on the underside of their abdomen that is called a furcula so if we were ever going to have another vocabulary um test like we did one time the furcula is a little it's just a, a structure that they literally can snap and it flings them into the air so this question says um, some say they fling themselves randomly but how could they be congregating well they do still have little legs so they're going to use their little cute little legs to crawl and congregate into these groups here they're going to use their furcula to escape for any kind of threat so they really can't direct themselves very well. There's been all kinds of funny research done on that, um, whether or not they can really direct themselves. They really can't very well. So it's like doing a slingshot that's hard to direct um, very well. So yeah, they're congregating here probably for food, maybe for mating, which they don't do internally, by the way. So you wouldn't see them actually having internal fertilization. The female has to sort of do a little dance and the male does a little dance. And then the male deposits a little spermatophore and the female just kind of climbs across it and absorbs it um, into her cloaca that way. So, uh, you know, I'm guessing these are feeding. That's a lot of springtails. So there's got to be some delicious food and maybe they've been cold for a while in the wintertime. So that's my best guess there. Aha, last month you gave a wonderful description of an albino porcupine. So this was actually part of a two-part question from Linda and Jaffrey. And I remember uh, because it was a porcupine, it came to me. This porcupine is one in 10,000. It's an albino. It's very uncommon. Um, and this one is a true albino. It has the red, it had the red eyes. Um, but then look what happened. Now he returned to the yard and all his back quills are gone. What happened to them? Well, uh, I got something to tell you that happened to him. This porcupine was protecting itself. And if anybody's ever watched a porcupine, um, you might notice if it ever feels kind of threatened, it's going to turn its face away from you. And it's 
quills are going to come up. It's going to kind of like raise the hair on the back of its neck the way a dog or a cat might do. Um, and that's going to push them up and it's going to turn its back and kind of um, turn its protect its face, which is has less quills and predators who try to bite them, whether it's a fisher or a coyote or a bobcat or a great horn owl or your dog is, might get a face full of quills if they're not careful. And that's exactly what happened with this. And just to mention, porcupines have over 30,000 quills on their body, which is pretty amazing. That adds up to between 160 quills every square inch of their body. And it takes them actually a long time to grow their quills back. It can take them up to three months. The quills only grow about two millimeters every couple of days. So this porcupine protecting itself lost a lot of its quills and now it's more vulnerable as you can see. I also just wanna mention that that section, the back section, um, where it lost the majority of its quills, also has a scent gland um, called a roseate, and that has a really musky odor, and it's not a great smell, and I think that's part of its protection too. So not only do you get a face full of quills, but you get a really bad stink. What is going on with our hemlocks? A concern, Monadnock resident. So yeah, it looks like there's snow, but Jenna, that's but not no, snow. sadly what the not. Heck? So this, um, there are two possible pests when you look at a hemlock tree and the needles like this. Um, the first is the hemlock woolly adelgid, which this is, um, and I'll tell you how to tell the difference in a second. And the second is the elongate hemlock scale. And so they're both in the same um, group of insects, which is in the scale insects. Um, the, those are related to aphids. So they have a long piercing mouth part and that they insert into the plant tissue and suck out the sap. So it's really, really bad for the tree. Um, this is the hemlock woolly adelgid. And the way you can tell the difference is that the white, um, in this case, it's fuzzy if we were to get really close to it. Um, if the white is at the base of the needle, whereas if it were the elongate hemlock scale, it would be on the needle. Um, you can sort of see it in, the one there's like, well, it's okay. If if you were to see the white on the needle itself, it would probably be the elongate hemlock scale. These are both invasive insects. Um, the hemlock woolly adelgid was first found in New Hampshire in the year 2000 in Portsmouth. And the elongate hemlock scale came a bit later. So they're both throughout the Southern part of the state. Um, the hemlock woolly adelgid just goes a little bit further north because it's been here longer. So um, this is not good for this tree. Um, a, a tree that is infested with the hemlock woolly adelgid will at the maximum live about 10 years. Um, if it's an ornamental tree, like in your front yard or something or on a college campus, it can be treated and, and with usually some either pesticides that are injected into the tree, or it can be treated with a horticultural oil to smother the insects. Um, but if it's in the forest, there's not much that can be done. So that's sad. But if you do have hemlock trees that are healthy in your yard or area or campus, um, one thing that's really important is not to have bird feeders nearby because birds, these insects don't disperse well on their own. They don't <clears throat> have, it's very unusual for them to like, un, like sort of uh, unattach and disperse. So what they're going to be dispersing with is um, mostly squirrels and birds. Birds are a really big dispersal agent. So if you have, if you're attracting birds to the area near your hemlock tree for them to perch in while they're waiting to go to the feeder, um, that's a way that they get um, infested in that situation. So if you have a few hemlock trees in your yard, um, probably don't put some bird feeders up in the months when you'll see this white fluffy stuff. Um, so yeah, bummer. This is a bummer of a bug. Ah, <laughs> hmm, who's looking at who? I enjoy watching birds at my feeder. Last year, I had a black bear destroy a sunflower feeder very close to my house. April 1st is the date recommended for removing feeders, and I'm ready to take them down. Is there any bird seed I can leave in a feeder that won't attract a bear? Thanks from Alan in Fitzwilliam. This is kind of like a dual question. So, um, First, I will respond about the bear, which is no, there is, 
if it's anything tasty, like seed, suet, uh, anything like that, the bear is going to come and be attracted to it. Um, but perhaps, uh, Eric, you might want to chime in about um, the bird feeding season. So, yeah, so Fish and Game recommends that you don't put feeders up before December 1st and you take them down after after April 1st. Um, and so, you know, we try and we try and operate legally at, in, 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 at the Harris Center. And so we, we, we observe those, those that, that window. So we do feed birds during the winter. But I will say that with the winter that we've had at the moment, or lack of one, some folks might say, I mean, what was it? Someone said yesterday it was mid-40s. 60s. Um, I would question whether the... And, and bears don't hibernate to the... They don't truly hibernate like... Um, like groundhogs do. So so the torpor that bears are in, they can wake up fairly quickly. And so if it's warm weather like this, um, I would I would suggest that bears are a threat to a bird feeding station throughout the winter. And so I think it's wise to take food down. I'm taking personally at home where I live in Hancock, I'm taking my bird feeders in every night, even even now. And until we get a really cold snap of a couple of weeks of of really cold weather, I'm going to continue to do that because I think the bears are active. And Eric, um, I noticed we've gotten a lot of phone calls at the Harris Center, and maybe some people who are watching tonight have noticed this too. There, the birds aren't really coming into the bird feeder, and there's lots of concern: are the bird is the bird population going down? Are there no birds around? But I think there's something else at play, and perhaps you want to talk about why yeah. why aren't people yeah. seeing that many birds? Yeah, thank thank you for mentioning that, Susie. So. I know Audubon is getting deluged with calls. Where are my birds? Where are my birds? And people are concerned and understandably concerned. But first, my first comment would be bird declines are something that's measured in, in intervals of 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. You generally, unless it's something catastrophic, you're not going to see abundance one year and, and absence the next year based on a bird decline. That's just the, the plastic nature of bird populations where they're in one place one year and another place the next year. And we have a question later on in this um, series that addresses a bird that's very, very much like that, that it's it's episodic in its nature. It, it follows the food. And so if you think about the pines that, you know, are in, in the pine cones after yesterday's windstorm, the roads are littered with pine cones because we had a huge bumper crop of pine cones. And so birds that feed on pine cones are abundant around here at the moment. Next year, when there's no pine cones, they won't be. So what, what we're seeing at bird feeders is there's a lot of natural food in the forest. We just had our Christmas bird count. And actually, it was a record-breaking record Christmas bird count, both because it was warm and a lot of birds hadn't gone south. And also, there was just really a lot of birds. And so there's nothing wrong with bird populations. Um, so it's, there's plenty wrong. But in terms of what why you're not seeing... Um, birds at your feeder that's not an that's not a, an issue to be concerned about birds are in the forest if we get a snowfall and if we get really cold weather they will come to your feeders but right now they don't have the need okay, that's good to know i'll strike it off my worry list <laughs> all right uh, uh, here's just more about bears and feeders a bear came and hit our bird feeder in greenfield near the francis line is it no longer safe to feed birds through the winter and i really think that eric addressed that well um, where if we have warm winters the bears aren't going to be staying um, in their um, kind of resting state and they'll come out and if you get a warm spell bring your feeders in that's probably really good bears can get habituated to coming to your feeder even if you put your feeder out and take it in there's still things that drop to the ground so you still could have a bear visiting but you won't lose your bear your bird feeders so that's that's about that oh here's another great bird question and i love that this is from Addie in maine who's eight years old how can i stop birds from flying into my big window and getting hurt eric you got any good tips for everybody yeah so i would so first thing is the windows that are really windows are hugely problematic and in terms of bird mortality in point source bird mortality so not things that are dispersed like climate change or um you know, atmospheric issues that that are, are hard to pin to put your finger on, but point source problems like cats and um, windows, they're huge killers of birds. By some estimates, hundreds of millions of birds per year 
and um, some the most of you, you will find that if you if you have a house with a lot of glass, you most likely will find that you're you have bird strikes occasionally. And if you don't get up early, sometimes I was at my mom's in Dublin, Ireland uh, last last year, and I found two birds dead under the uh, under a particular window, which I I, I uh, addressed with with um, decals, which I'll talk about in a minute. But by afternoon, those birds were gone. They'd been scavenged. So so look for if you've got a problem window, um, look for for bird carcasses early in the morning before they're scavenged by scavengers. And so the worst offending windows tend to be windows where you, where you have an opposite window each side of the house and a bird can see right through the house and um, will uh, try and fly, unsuccessfully try and fly through the house and hit the window. And, and very often these birds don't make it. So, the, so what I would recommend is um, first, either put your feeder really close to the window so that a bird can, so if, if you have birds on a feeder and a hawk comes and scatters the bird, it can be so close to the window that it can't get up ahead of steam when it hits the window or else really far from the window. But bird, but, but feeders that are six feet away from a window, it's just that perfect distance where if a hawk comes by, by the time a bird flies six feet away, by the time it hits the window, it's fast enough that it can break its neck. And then the second thing, if you do have a window that's just problematic, there are solutions. You can get bird decals, which are certainly better than nothing. Um, the American Bird Conservancy has done a lot of research, and there are there's glass now that you can you can specifically buy to um, to address this that has micro stripes that are invisible to the human eye, um, but birds can see. Um, but anything to break up the outline. Some some um, people have reported a lot of success with the uh, design. There's a design that um, has kind of cords that come down the outside of the window, so hanging cords, and that that also. Uh, breaks anything to break up the outline. If you have screens, um, I leave my screens on. My screens are up on my windows now year round because that provides a cushion if a bird does hit the window. So birds, bird feeders um, close to the window or far away from the window, not in the six foot range. Break up the window outline. Check with the American Bird Conservancy for, um, for, for things you can buy if you can't find them in your local store. And... Um, Keep an eye out for bird carcasses to identify because some windows will be worse offenders than other than others. Thank you, Eric. That was really good information. And maybe some people can put on their birthday, on their Christmas list, some um, bird decals for their windows. Or if they're planning to replace their windows, they could that those windows sound pretty cool with the embedded bird preventers. <clears throat> All right. Whoa. This is like a story. I'll, I'll read it and you can read it too along. This year, the grass carrying wasps have nested in just about every window frame of our home. We have watched them carrying grass in and out of the corners of our windows and watched the development of the larvae and even recently provided a bee house to encourage nesting elsewhere. We would very much like additional information on how we might encourage nesting in other areas of our property as we understand they are pollinators. This is from Debbie from Keene in 2020. Jenna, what the heck? And why is there a pile of dead grasshoppers? Is, is that what that is? What is <laughs> yes, this? This is they're, gruesome. Um, yeah, they're tree crickets. And I think, uh, Miles, if you go to the net, yeah, there you go. That's where you can really see them. Um, so these insects are fascinating. They are a solitary species of wasp, meaning that they don't um, congregate in big groups like bumblebees or honeybees or things like that. Um, so there are six species of grass carrying wasps in North America. And this obviously is um, in Debbie's area. She has a good population. So they are pollinators um, in the sense that the adult wasps will visit flowers and pollinate them. In particular, they like goldenrod, they like mint, they like bone set. So if you have a lot of that, in your area, you might have some grass carrying wasps. So if there were no window sills, they would be nesting in hollow um, stems of plants. They would be nesting in um, any kind of spaces in like old logs and trees outside. But what's happening here is they're going to bring the grass in. They are going to provision little compartments, as you can see here with the prey, in this case, their favorite prey, are these tree crickets. And then they're going to lay an egg and they're going to sort of seal up that, put some more grass and then they'll, they'll do this a bunch of times and then the mom will just leave. 
And the idea is that, that the, the egg will hatch and then the larva will feed on the dead or stunned wasps. I mean, sorry, tree crickets. Um, and, and then once it has fed until it's ready to pupate, it will form a pupa and then it will leave the area. Now, um, there is no, they've actually done research to see if there's any kind of um, memory as there is in some species where, not memory, literally, but um, genetic sort of memory as to, okay, I was raised in this windowsill, therefore I will then raise my offspring in this windowsill. And the answer is no. But if you have a really nice windowsill and you have a lot of these grass carrying wasps, it's very likely that you will get more nesting in your windowsills next year. So it's very, I, there actually are papers written about how to deter them and there hasn't been a lot of success, except um, people have said maybe don't have the host species of the plants that the adults like, which is somewhat problematic if you like your flowers, right? Um, but these wasps also, uh, just to note, they don't sting, they're not aggressive. The females only use their stinger to stun the crickets for the most part. So it's not a big problem in terms of a pest for human danger. Um, I think it's pretty cool. I'd be really excited if these nested at my house. Yeah, um, I, I, just, I just have a, I have to ask this question. The, yeah. gra the, the crickets, yeah. are they dead? Are they paralyzed? Are they zombies? What, what? They, they're they, from they everything I understand they're they're basically sort of stunned by the venom of the female because oh. if they were dead they would start to decompose and then it wouldn't be good food for the larva as it grows right so they're stunned by this I don't I I'm I have many questions too Susie because this is one of these things where I'm like well how long does it last and do they start moving in your windowsill um but from everything that I've read the answer is no. The biggest hassle is you just can't really close your window well because you don't want to hurt them. Oh my gosh, Jenna, you it's always, crazy, right? You have always the most fascinating uh, creatures. Uh, and well, that's because stories. the insects are amazing, right? <laughs> They're amazing. Yes, they really yeah. are. I love it. Thank you. And thanks for uh, sending that in. All right, moving on. This bird has been in our yard all winter and I have never seen it here during the winter months. Could it be a gray cat bird? And if so, why has it remained here instead of migrating? And this is from Ray from January of 2023. And so Eric, back to you. What's up with the gray cat bird? Yeah, so um, Ray, good good uh, observation. This is indeed a gray cat bird. It's, uh, it's graphite gray with a black cap, and you can't really see it too well, but really chestnut colored under tail coverts and a fairly fine bill. Um, it eats a lot of insects in the summer. And so this is a bird that breeds across the eastern and central United States up into Canada. And um, in winter, it doesn't completely vacate the U.S., but it concentrates on the Gulf Coast and extends up the East Coast. In, and the, the concentration is mainly on the Gulf Coast with lesser numbers extending up the East Coast. And then a lot of birds are um, trans-Gulf migrants. So there's, a, there's a, a lot of birds go to the Caribbean, to Caribbean islands, Cuba, Hispaniola, uh, the Yucatan, and on down into Panama. So there's not a complete vacation of the U.S., but uh, most of the most of the population vacates, vacates the uh, certainly the northern U.S. And it's in New Hampshire, it's generally absent, except you might get one or two individuals in the extreme southeast of the state, which is ten, generally more temperate than the rest of the, the state. But this year is an exception. And so, as I had mentioned earlier, we just had our Christmas bird count. And normally in a Christmas, there's about 10 Christmas bird counts around around New Hampshire every winter. And normally there might be one or two catbirds seen in New Hampshire in, in, a, in a Christmas bird count. And that would be generally in the Christmas bird count down in the Seacoast region. But this year in Peterborough, we had a we had, I think, two catbirds seen, and we had which was just last weekend. So it's 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 winter season, and there was two catbirds in the Peterborough count, and I think Keene had a couple also. And again, it's the it's the extremely mild winter. There's no ice, there's no snow. Well, there is ice, but there's not much ice. There's no snow, or very little snow. And so the food resources that these birds in the in the winter are primarily frugivores. So they eat winterberry, um, nightshade, bittersweet nightshade, bittersweet 
any any sort of fruiting berries that that birds will traditionally eat, this bird will, will feast on. It will also come to feeders. It will eat um, it will eat uh, shelled sunflower. So if you're if you are feeding birds, shelled sunflower and sunflower seed with the shell on and the shell off will pre pretty much provide for everything. And so this bird in hard times will take shelled sunflower and suet. And so it's just, it's a fun, the, the milder our winters get, the more we're going to see um, birds like this. And so the Christmas bird count just gone. A lot of counts broke records for um, the number of species. And that was because a lot of birds that traditionally head south, um, facultative migrants, they're called, not obligate. So like a bird that winters in Peru is going to go south to Peru because it can't, you know, it's, it's, um, it's predetermined to, to head south. It can't, it can't, um, adjust its migratory strategy based on w warm winters in New Hampshire. But birds that just go a little bit south to Massachusetts, to Connecticut, to the southern U.S. can can adjust their strategies based on the winters here. And so, like I said, this is a bird that can winter in the, in the lower Atlantic states down to the Gulf Coast. They're just extending the range farther north in the winter, as are sapsuckers, as are, are um, winter wrens. A lot of birds that are, are, are near, near migrants are, are um, present in small numbers in New Hampshire now during the winter, in mild winters. Fascinating, Eric. Um, I mean, this is interesting because this is from Ray in January of 2023, right? So that's that's almost like a year ago. So this is maybe becoming the new norm, which is unsettling. So yeah, and sap, so I'll just end with sap suckers now used to be very uncommon in winter. They're now becoming more and more common in winter as our winters become mild. Moving on to a more gruesome topic. <laughs> My 1,000 gallon fish pond has goldfish and lots of frogs. Today I came across a leopard frog eating another leopard frog. Good golly. Sure enough, they eat anything they can get in their mouths and, and this one has a big mouth. All right, that's from Alan and Fitzwilliam who um, God, I can't even believe captured this photograph. Brett, is this true? Is this cannibalism that we're watching? Um, first of all, it's an incredible photo um, and it may be cannibalism. I can't actually say for sure. Uh, um, it is possible that it is cannibalism. I can say that it is not a leopard frog. Um, so we'll start kind of with some of the, the frog ID and then we can talk a little bit about the predation that we're seeing. So there are a lot of frogs in our neck of the woods that have spots of various kinds. Um, in fact, many of our frogs have some sort of spot. And so if you see spots on a frog, it doesn't necessarily automatically mean it's a leopard frog. That's where a lot of our minds go because leopards have spots and we that's what we think. But um, leopard frogs are actually quite uncommon in the southern part of New Hampshire. Um, in this, and, and if it were a leopard frog, the spots would be um, darker and a little bit better defined and would have like a light ring around each of them. So in this case, I, I would say instead of spots, it's really more modeling that we're seeing, a modeled appearance, which is true of both bullfrogs and green frogs. And bullfrogs and green frogs look very much alike. And my um, go-to, well, there's a few go-tos in this picture. One of my go-tos for telling them apart is that bullfrogs, the green frogs have ridges running down the length of their back, parallel ridges called dorsolateral ridges, right there where Miles is putting the... Um, Cursor. You can see here that this big frog does not have ridges. And so that's how I can tell that it's a bullfrog. One of the ways I can tell. So if it were a green frog, it would have ridges running down its back. Um, bullfrogs do not. The other way that you can tell is the size of this animal. Bullfrogs can weigh up to five pounds. They can be enormous. Um, there are no other frog species in New Hampshire that could get that big. Um, so what we have here is a bullfrog. Now, what it's eating is a little harder to tell because I can't see that animal's back. I can't tell if there are ridges on the animal's back. I can only see its legs, and those could be uh, green frog legs or bullfrog legs. Um, and me like many amphibians, bullfrogs do engage in cannibalism of their own species. And Alan is correct that they eat pretty much anything they can get in their mouths. Um, and so it may be eating a bullfrog, another bullfrog. It may also be eating a green frog. And I did find when I was kind of looking into this a little more an interesting um, study results 
that said that because of their voraciousness, bullfrogs can have a powerful influence on the number and type of other frogs present in a wetland. The impact on green frogs is particularly pronounced. So after a local bullfrog extinction at Point Pele, Ontario, green frog populations quadrupled. Wow. So when bullfrogs were there, they really suppressed the green frog populations um, by eating adult frogs. They also eat their tadpoles um, and bullfrog tadpoles will also eat other tadpoles. So this is kind of happening at all different life stages. So um, and in fact, bullfrogs out west where they're not native are a real um, problem in wetlands. Uh, in the Western US. Here they are native to our um, local ecosystems and um, quite stunning to behold when they get to be this big and this hungry. And it's a really amazing um, thing that Alan witnessed. So thanks for yes. thanks to him for sending it in. Brett, thank you. I feel like I need a jug of rum after that <laughs> explanation. Okay, that was bad. Okay, here is a poll for you. We're going to um, play a couple of calls. It says, what species is this and why are we hearing it throughout the forest in the Monadnock region? So here's the call. hearing sure it was me on the tin whistle you all lose <laughs> no so this is really fascinating so this is a red crossbill song and the the second um sound that was being played was the red crossbill flight call both the same species but i've been hearing that they're normally i've been living in this area now for 20 20 odd for 25 odd years and they're normally not here they're an uncommon bird normally in in monadnock in southern New Hampshire, and there's two years now where the, they've where they, I would describe them as common, and this is one of the two years. The other one was like five or six years ago, and that both years coincided with a huge pine cone crop. So these are these are, I wouldn't call them migrants because you think of migrants going north, south, north, south on a, an annual basis, and these birds don't do that. They go north, south, east, west, northwest, southeast, wherever the food is. They basically follow the um, the the fruiting um abundant they follow they go where the food is and so they're they're specialists they feed there's different populations of red crossbill that some populations prioritize hemlock some populations prioritize fir and these the the type we have here are um white pine is a favorite and so they're basically traveling around um wherever white pine is in fruit and so right now White pine, as you know, because as, as I mentioned, the winds yesterday were were really um, quite strong and a lot of pine cones were knocked to the ground. White pines for the last, it's a two year cycle for a white white, white pine, pine cone. So the pine cones that we're seeing now actually were not last summer, but the summer before um, was the start of their cycle. And when they fruit, um, that's when the, the crossbills can extract. They use their, their crossed bill. They're, they're an actually well-named bird. Their, their mandibles are overlapping. Uh, they use their bills like a tweezers to extract the seeds. And so that's why they're really common now. And really, from I find this fascinating. For the last month and a half, two months, I've started to hear them sing. And so why would a bird be singing in, in November, December? Well, these birds are actually breeding now, and they're one, they're one of the only birds that will actually breed in any month of the year. All 12 months of the year, crossbills can breed. And the reason is because their food resources can be available at any month of the year. They're, they're so, there's such a super abundance of white pine cones when, when they eventually, um, when, when they, they come into fruit, that, that the food resource can persist throughout the 12 months. And so birds will are the white white red crossbills i'm sorry are known to breed in any any one of the 12 months of the year and so they're actually now breeding in the um in the monadnock region and that's why they're singing i'm stunned by that that's really cool thank you so much and thanks for sharing the sound too all right let's see what our next question is aha okay let's get ready this is a little gruesome 
A friend and I came across this blue jay kill along the Harris Center's North Pond Trail on November 8th. After taking a closer look in and amongst the feathers, we found the jay's bill and face. I have found plenty of feather piles in the woods before, but never one that contained part of the animal's head. Any idea who the predator could be? And this is from, I think, our very own Brett. Um, and we're, we're just a warning. We are going to show you the picture. It is a little gruesome if you don't want to see it you might want to turn your head um, there it is and maybe uh, miles maybe we'll just go back to the feather picture while um you might think that i would answer this question because you think oh this has got to be a mammal predator i can tell by the way this animal was eaten that it was not a mammal predator and so i must turn it over to my good friend the tin whistle jig dancing, cross build fan, Eric Masterson. Will you tell us what this is and how come we could tell that it was a aerial predator? Yes, because the bird has been plucked like a turkey for Christmas, a mammal. You you can chime in on, on how a mammal would eat this, Brett, but, or I'm sorry, Susie, but a bird will, a hawk will pluck its prey before consuming it. And so you said this was on the North Pond Trail. So there's a beautiful lake pond um, right there, North Pond right there. It's in the interior of, of a forest. So that rules out it's probably not a red-tailed hawk because they're not a, an interior bird. It's probably a Cooper's hawk because they're an interior forest bird and they're the more common of the exhibitors down here. It could be a sharp shin, but they're less common. It could be a goshawk, but I suspect this is a Cooper's hawk. They're an interior forest bird. They will have a plucking post. And so this is a bird that maybe uses this, this um, log on a regular basis to pluck its, pluck its prey. But this was a, a, a certainly a, a hawk that plucked this blue jay bear before consuming it. And one of the reasons the head is, is um, f featured in the next slide is because the uh, brains are full of protein and uh, nutrients. And many birds, especially owls, will will um, prioritize the prioritize the brain. So my guess is this is a Cooper's hawk. How would a how would a uh, mammal eat this bird, um, Susie? Well, it wouldn't spend any time plucking the feathers. It would just eat it, um, and then it would digest it. And we would see this in another incarnation with a scat full of feathers and probably some. So uh, mammals are going to be eating it. They don't have to worry so much about being light for the flight. And yeah, a plucking post is a new word for me. Oh, and here we go. This is right up the next alley for me, the scat specialist. Trisha and I have spent the week around Franconia Notch hiking on the Cascade, Cascade Trail. We came across the scat sitting atop a rock in the middle of the path. I love this last line. Such a tiny little offering, but what would have left it? From David. And again, I just got to give a really good shout out for David for including a quarter in this picture because I get, you wouldn't even want to know how many scat pictures I get a week on my phone from people texting me in my email box. After all, people do call me the princess of poop. So I get it. But if it doesn't have scale in it, it's going to be really hard to identify. But this quarter plus this twisty shape um, really gives me the spot on clue of one of my favorite scats to find. This is from a little weasel, most likely. Um, and I can tell because weasel scat, I love this part, weasel scats look a little bit like weasels themselves. They're kind of long and twisty. And here we have a very long and twisty scat that is very small. It could be a mink scat too, um, but mink scat, I would look for some more aquatic find on it. This looks like it's got some fur in it. Um, so, you know, could be a large weasel or a small mink, but it's definitely in the weasel family. And it's most likely, in my opinion, a weasel. And it is a tiny, fine little offering. So thank you, David, for sending that in. And if it ate a blue jay, which it wouldn't, but if it did, we would see a lot of feathers. Okay, here is last week, I came across this lovely lady at work in the front yard garden. There were some other dug up spaces, much like the one she was making here. Would we have had more than one turtle laying eggs in our yard? Perhaps the daughters of the previous visitors? Do these turtles make test holes? Some of the digs were small and shallow. Brett, what can you tell us about snapping turtles and their eggs and their nesting? Yeah, so we don't have a date on this one, but since this is our year in review, Ask a Naturalist, I'm assuming it wasn't actually last week since it's December now. And this picture, my guess, was taken in May or June, which is 
uh, the prime turtle nesting time in our neck of the woods. It's a really beautiful picture of this turtle nesting. Um, and so, yes, it is very possible that if you, um, especially if you live near water and if you have a nice sandy yard, um, that you might have more than one turtle laying eggs in your yard. Um, there are even um, places where they, um, where conservation organizations have created turtle gardens of sandy areas, somewhat close to water bodies to encourage turtles to nest all together in places where they can be more easily protected and where they might not have to cross roads. So turtles are looking for loose, well-drained, sandy soil um, in which to lay their eggs. May and June are prime time for that. Uh, and that's, they, they pick the best site they can they, um, they dig their nest hole. Snapping turtles can lay up to 30 eggs in one clutch. Um, and they cover that back up and then they head back to their lake or pond or river. And that is the end of their parental care. Um, really, it's just picking the best place. And then they kind of let the earth incubate their eggs. Um, in terms of the multiple digs that you saw, it is common for them to, do, to dig false nests. And um, so to do some scrapes, and then maybe it's because they decide that wasn't really the best place after all. It's not where they want to go. Maybe they got disrupted or interrupted by a person or a dog or a predator, and they, they change their mind. There's also some um, thought that this may be part of a predator uh, evasion technique. So snapping, some turtles lay multiple clutches in a year. Snapping turtles only lay one clutch each year, snapping turtle females. And 95, up to 95% of those eggs get eaten by raccoons, foxes, and other predators. So it's really, really hard um, for a turtle. It's a hard world. It's hard to her world to be a turtle in. So it's hard. 95% um, of the eggs get eaten. So that means only a tiny percentage of them hatch. Um, and then of those hatchlings, they're great food for all kinds of things as well. Um, so when you see a turtle getting as big as this female is, it's really amazing. I mean, it takes them 10 to 15 years just to become reproductively mature, and then they could live up to 100 years after that. Um, so this is, Jill is really lucky that she has turtles coming to her yard. And so, yes, there are test holes, there are false scrapes, and yes, there's probably more than one turtle laying eggs there. Um, I don't know about whether they're the daughters of the previous visitor. It's possible, but it would take, you know, it takes them, as I said, 10 to 15 years to get to the point where they can lay eggs. So it could be, um, they're very long lived species, um, but they also just could be, it could be really good habitat for them. And you might near live near water where there's a bunch of turtles. So um, I will just say if this, if you see this in your yard, um, you can kind of go the extra mile and put um a predator exclusion device on top of the nest. If you're sure that there are eggs in it. Um, we did this on my, um, in, my, in my road for a couple painted turtle nests this year, to keep the raccoons out, give them, um, a, a little bit of a head start in, in evading the predators. Oh, and then, um, I don't know if she asked when, when they should start looking for hatchlings, but they tend to emerge in late August or September. Uh, and make their way to water then for snapping turtles. Occasionally they'll overwinter underground in the nest and come out the following spring. Um, but for snappers, my observation is that late August and September, you see a lot of hatchlings out and about. Um, painted turtles, they tend to overwinter underground and come out uh, in April or May after some, usually after some good rain to loosen up the soil. So Cool. I love the idea of turtle gardens. I think uh, more people should have them It'd be great for turtles. All right. We are on to our last slide. I know we're going a little bit over, but this one is worth waiting for just for this picture alone. Do flying squirrels live in colonies? We had a large group like this on occasion as long ago as 45 years. This is just one frame from a very, very busy 23 second video. There were so many of these little guys zipping around. It was impossible to count them. Love your programs. Well, Max and Connie, we love you too. And this, we love this picture. So flying squirrels. Yes. Uh, we have two types of flying squirrels here in New Hampshire. We have the Northern 
flying squirrel and the southern flying squirrel. And they're very hard to tell apart. The northern flying squirrel is a little bit bigger than the southern. And the northern flying squirrel is a conifer specialist. So they really like the conifer trees and they're a little bit less flexible in where they live. Whereas the southern flying squirrel, they just kind of live wherever they can. And that might include your attic. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of research that shows that northern flying squirrels and southern flying squirrels will live in your attic and they will live communally in the winter. And this makes sense. This is the way of them keeping warm. They're staying active all winter long. And as they stay active all winter long, it's very cold. So if there's more bodies in a space, they're going to keep warmer. So you can have up to, I've read a lot of research on this to get ready for this question, 50 flying squirrels. Now, some of you probably know this because maybe you feel like you have 50 flying squirrels in your attic because you can hear them. So people say, it sounds like I have chipmunk in my walls. If you hear um, noises in your attic that sound like scurrying and scampering, like somebody's throwing a big party up there, it is probably these little fellas or little people, little squirrels, and they are um, communally nesting all winter long and they're chewing up your insulation and they're pooping. They might even eat your electrical wiring. It's a really good idea once the winter's over because you don't want them to get in trouble. It, you know, you want to hurt them um, to have somebody come in and work on um, plugging up any holes that they're getting through. Um, and I will just mention that there's a fabulous flying squirrel project. We had a great speaker. I missed it, but I listened to it. It is a new, oh, I heard about it, the New England Flying Squirrel Network. And you can, um, you can put up some flying squirrel nest boxes and be part of this study. And I'm hoping that maybe Brett will put that in the chat for us, um, but it's really cool. And you can also um, do some more reading about it on their webpage, which was really fascinating. So on that note, I'll just say, maybe this winter you'll find a good squirrel to huddle up with and keep sending us your, natural history mysteries. Um, and we will be collecting them all and having another chance to ask a naturalist. So thank you all for sending in your questions, for being curious, for showing up tonight to hear these answers. And thank you to the panelists who gave such great answers.